by welcome my beloved family member, Jared Weiss. I want to do a shout out to his parents, uh, my cousin Mark and his wife Sarah. And I've had the privilege of um, watching Jared grow up and now fulfill his dream of becoming a full-time sports writer, writing for The Athletic, which I'll have you talk in a moment a little bit more about. And his assignment for The Athletic is covering the Boston Celtics. Our focus is going to be a lengthy essay, uh, 10 pages typed, entitled Opinion, Stephen Jackson, Situation Presents Unique Opportunity for Empathy and Unity, which was about 10 days ago, uh, 15 days ago now. And it was in response to certain anti-Semitic social media posts by an NFL player named Jackson and a former NBA player named Jackson. So that'll be the starting point. I know that looking at this uh, list, there's a number of NBA fans who've also um, tuning in. And Jared is an expert on the NBA. That's why he gets paid to, to cover the stories and to interface with the NBA players. So I don't want to forget. I'm going to say it out loud. We're going to, among others, talk about a very prominent draft choice. Dena Avdija, who is an Israeli Kurd and uh, is coming up for the draft. So my son Joey told me about that. In that regard, a shout out before I begin to my son Joey and my friend Ed Heyman for all the articles they have shared with me to prepare. And I want to thank my wife, Linda, who read your article, Jared, and said, this is really a great article and you've been doing these COVID interviews. Maybe people could take a break from COVID and would value um, you interviewing Jared. So I am grateful, Jared, in Boston, right? You're located in Boston now? Yeah. So coast to coast conversation. As a place to begin, becoming a full-time NBA writer was an early dream. So to give context to people who don't know you and the context for you writing for The Athletic, talk a little bit about when you, that started, your quest to be a sports writer. Hmm. I would say there were two things that happened to me in probably third grade <laughs> would be we found, we recently found empirical evidence of one of them, which was that my mom, Sarah, found a I guess it was like a pseudo yearbook page where on there I had to write what is my dream job. And I think I wrote basketball reporter or basketball <laughs> journalist. So that was pretty funny to find. So I, I grew out of my astronaut phase earlier than I realized. I think I realized I just wasn't good enough at geometry to put astronaut as my realistic goal. But so the other thing was there is a, um, a very famous writer in Boston who writes for the Boston Globe named Dan Shaughnessy. And he's written some very famous books about the Celtics and the Boston Red Sox. And my dad was generous enough to win a raffle at my school to get to have lunch with Dan Shaughnessy when I was, I want to say, third grade. And so we met him at a local bar called O'Hara's down the street from our house in Newton. And he was a fellow Newton resident. Um, and so we, we had lunch and it was a really great experience. And I noticed as we were leaving that he went and he got in his car and it was a Toyota Camry. And I asked my dad something like, why isn't he driving a Ferrari? Doesn't he write for the <laughs> Boston Globe? <laughs> and so that's when I realized that being a sports reporter didn't pay millions of dollars like I assumed it did. Um, and so unless you're Stephen A. Smith and you yell on TV for uh, a couple hours a day, then you can buy yourself a Ferrari. But so, um, yeah, so I kind of, I always knew that sports journalism was ne was not necessarily a uh, a path to to the most comfortable lifestyle in the world down the road, but it was just something that I always knew in the back of my head that I really truly loved, and it was the the one thing that I knew would be I would be passionate 
and dedicated to it enough that no matter what obstacles would come along with it or what sacrifices would have to come along with it, I knew that I would still be happy pushing forward with that. And I have to credit my parents that my entire childhood, they always told me that, you know, money can buy a lot of things, but it really truly can't buy not just happiness, but of a feeling of contentment and a feeling of purpose. And so I found myself doing work that I thought would kind of check off a lot of those boxes, which is that I went to school, I studied political science, I had ideas of either working in policy or in international diplomacy, something of that nature. I ended up uh, kind of stumbling into being a bank regulator and it was a good job and it, it actually paid pretty well, I had good benefits. And I was doing for the most part work that was both good quality work and was really impactful in a positive way on society, but I was just so bored. And I found my, my brain eroding at the, you know, it was a very repetitive job. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't structuring policy the way I wanted it to. It was all about implementing somewhat, a policy that was shaped by somebody else. And it was that lack of creativity was very frustrating. And so I decided to just spend all my free time every night, every weekend, trying to build up my basketball writing career. And I tried to take a very unique approach by trying to develop a real expertise on the X's and O's of the things that are happening on the court, which is something that used to be really only reserved for former players that became commentators after they retired. Those, those were the only people that tended to actually be able to write about that kind of stuff. But um, I tried to be part of a wave of younger writers that had the knowledge because we had access to YouTube and other resources that we could actually learn all of that stuff on our own. And so it, it, it worked and I was uh, pretty patient and kept waiting for the right opportunity instead of diving into the first job that came my way. And I eventually got USA Today to hire me to run their Celtics coverage part-time. And I was working about a hundred hours a week and I hated working for USA Today. They were terrible <laughs> to work for. And um, I was pretty close to giving up and, and just deciding, I guess I'm gonna have to just have basketball writing be a hobby that I do on the side. And maybe about a month before I was about to give up, the athletic came calling and they gave me everything I could have possibly asked for. It was a low pressure situation. They wanted me to just write what I really excelled at and really just focus on taking my time to develop great stories. And so I took that on part time. And after about a year or so of working for them, they moved me into full time and I left the government work behind. And I'm happy to say I haven't missed it for a single day, although I miss a lot of the people and I miss some of the, the great work that we did protecting, you know, protecting the taxpayers and fighting against discrimination and lending and things like that. But I, I really do love every moment of this job and, I, you know, and it, I'm incredibly happy doing it. What is The Athletic? So The Athletic is very interesting company. So uh, we had these two co-founders, Alex Mather and Adam Hansman. Adam runs the editorial side. Alex runs the business side. And so they started in San Francisco. And I guess they basically were like, let's, you know, we're a couple Silicon Valley bros. Let's take the Silicon Valley bro approach to starting a media empire. And so they got their first round of seed funding in Silicon Valley. Um, they started off in Chicago and San Francisco, and I actually started doing some Warriors coverage for them while they were just in San Francisco at the time. And this was, I want to say, about 2016 or so. And it was starting to grow to the point that um, I think the Washington Post did an interview with them. And Alex said that they wanted to not only replace all of the dying sports pages at every sport, uh, newspaper in the country, but they wanted to take down the New York Times. And so... <laughs> That, that put a target on our back very quickly. And so um, and he's, he has said, said that he totally regrets saying that, but it was a very funny way for the company to really start. But it worked and it attracted more funding and they got a big seed round of a couple hundred million dollars. And their plan was Wait, they went- and, Jared, only because I'm aware of time and I want to transition. Oh, sure, sure. That's help give context that it, uh, is an online magazine and my understanding is it's kind of like the new online sports magazine exactly it's especially with sports illustrated kind of dying out this year sadly we've kind of become the new sports illustrated and the big difference i'll be very brief is that 
what we did was all the newspapers around the country were laying off all their sports reporters. So we hired all of them. And so the athletic has the best, the best reporter covering every single team in every city in the country, including all the hockey writers in Canada. And we just hired all of the great soccer writers in Britain now too. So wow. we've become the bit like the biggest network along with ESPN essentially. That's fantastic. Well, I'm delighted to know that your persistence and talent has allowed you to fulfill your dream of being the sports writer. Now we'll focus on this article that you wrote, um, on, which is an opinion piece. And again, it's over 2,600 words. It's a longer opinion type piece. Talk a little, give us a little context for what drew you to write about this topic of the Jacksons. So it started where the news about what Deshaun Jackson had posted, which I'm sure we'll get into in a few minutes, but he posted quotes that were attributed to Hitler about how there was essentially a conspiracy by the Jewish people and white people in America. Say, say a word who Deshaun Jackson is. Sure. Uh, Deshaun Jackson is a NFL star for the Philadelphia Eagles. Uh, he's a wide receiver. And so he posted some quotes that were, you know, pretty anti-Semitic. And then he pretty soon thereafter apologized, especially after the, his team, the Philadelphia Eagles, condemned him and their owner, of course, and their GM is Jewish. Um, and then it came into my purview because as an NBA writer, because a former NBA player who has become an incredibly popular commentator in the last few years since his retirement named Steven Jackson, no relation, um, he, he came out and posted some videos on Instagram defending Deshaun Jackson. And he spoke in very vague terms. And so it appeared as though, and I do believe it's still to be the case, it appeared as though he was defending not just Deshaun Jackson's right to speak out and to be controversial, but particularly the anti-Semitic opinions that he was espousing. And so a few, a few uh, other Jewish colleagues of mine, namely Fred Katz, Eric Corrine, and Kendra Andrews, who are my co-authors on the story, we all started kind of texting each other the night that those videos were coming out and saying, you know, how do we feel about this? And is this something that we should get together and you know, put, put together something uh, analyzing the situation and speaking out about the situation? And so it initially we did a podcast and we released the podcast and I felt that I wanted to write something because while a podcast can be an informative discussion that people can take away a lot from, in I, I guess a more um, general sense, writing an article allows you to craft your words with a level of specificity that people can take away very specific messages that they can also then share very easily. And it allows you to very carefully and succinctly craft your opinion. And so I ended up writing the op-ed and then I presented it to the other aforementioned writers and they gave their edits. And after a couple of days of editing, we ran it all the way up to the top of the company and then we published the story. Now I know that Deshaun Jackson had a follow-up a post that said, the Jews will extort America. Their plan for world domination won't work if the expl expletive know who they were. So it persisted a little bit, at least at the outset. What was the reaction? That's one of the things I found most fascinating in your article was the non-reaction of fellow players, by and large, in the NFL, the NBA, even the owners. Talk about how that surprised you. Yeah, so I initially actually wanted to phrase the opinion piece in a more aggressive stance and say that the NBA had failed utterly in their first attempt to confront racism within its own universe after providing so much support for the Black Lives Matter movement. And so what support um, did it provide for the Black Lives Matter? So the league is partnering with the players to create a foundation that's going to, among many things, invest in African American communities to address systemic racism and far, as far as job creation opportunity, education opportunity, things like that. But also within the organization itself, 
try to provide more executive opportunities for African American um, people, not just former players, but also people, civilians, I guess you could say, that worked their way into the league um, and other things of that nature. And then also provide tools to help players with their advocacy. So the so that's the NBA is led by a Jewish commissioner, Silver, and responded in many affirmative ways to the, the need to respond to Black Lives Matter. Now continue. What what was the response to these anti-Semitic comments by prominent professional athletes? So. Even before getting to those, I'm sure most people just heard you say Adam Silver is Jewish and think, how could the commissioner of the league who's Jewish not respond to this? And I felt that it was somewhat reasonable because Steven Jackson is a former player who no longer is officially affiliated with the league. And although he's a content creator that has a podcast and appears on TV shows and does represent the league in that capacity, it's not in a formal manner. And so it would be a dangerous precedent to set if they were to address someone who's not formally affiliated with the league, because then it creates an expectation that anytime anything like this pops up from any former player, regardless of their level of affiliation, that there would be some sort of formal response. So I understood Adam Silver not responding from that perspective. But the disappointment was the lack of response from players because Steven Jackson is constantly interacting with other current players on a regular basis, publicly and privately. Players are constantly going on to his show. They're interacting with him on social media. So it's very clear that a lot of these players heard what he was saying. And there was only one player in the wake of the situation that spoke out on his own volition. And it was uh, a Celt another Celtic player, Ennis Cantor, who is a uh, Turkish national who's currently the number one most wanted terrorist in Turkey by uh, Recep Erdogan. And he's someone who I've spoken a lot about Judaism with. Uh, Ennis and I are very close. I visited his mosque with him earlier this year to tell a story about his activism because he's a major activist for uh, freedom in Turkey. And he and I have had a lot of conversations about the Jewish faith and the Jewish community. And I was really proud to see that when, when this situation arose, he was literally the only athlete in the entire NBA that went and spoke out. And he went on CNN that night and spoke out. Um, and then after that, there were two other players. It was Jalen Brown of the Boston Celtics and Admiral Schofield of the Washington Wizards. And they spoke because myself and Fred Katz, my co-author, asked them about it in a press conference. But so there have been no other players that have spoken about it that I'm aware of. Now, a lot of what they, and I'll add for some who may not know that Steven Jackson was very identified with George Floyd. And in that regard, called him my twin, came even more to the foreground as a civil rights symbol and spokesperson. And here he was espousing anti-Semitic statements, largely identified with Louis Farrakhan. What, what can you tell us about Louis Farrakhan? I think you'll, you'll be the one that can tell me more about Louis Farrakhan's history, but I can tell you about his role right now, which is that there are a lot of African-American athletes that idolize him. and. We've been seeing this popping up on social media a lot over the past few weeks. It's been a major education for myself. And I want to thank my dad first off, because I think I initially mentioned Louis Farrakhan as a civil rights leader when I first started talking about this. And my dad said, you should probably do a little bit more research and really read up on Louis Farrakhan because as someone who doesn't really pay attention to Farrakhan, I knew that he was accused of being anti-Semitic and I knew he led the Million Man March. And that was pretty much all I knew about him. And obviously you just need to do a couple minutes in Google to figure out the remarkably like horrific level of anti-Semitism he espouses. But he's also a, a symbol for black empowerment in this country. And nowadays on Instagram, it's very easy to share quick clips of very compelling and impactful and powerful speakers and quick uh, quotes that go along with that. And people have been really sharing Louis Farrakhan on Instagram. And there's a lot of these players that Instagram is their main source of education. And so 
you know, that, and that's what Deshaun Jackson was doing in the first place. He was sharing um, the, the alleged Hitler quote about the Jewish conspiracy was, was something that was from a, uh, that was basically connected to a Louis Farrakhan teaching. And he's a follower of Louis Farrakhan. He had posted several messages of Louis Farrakhan. And over the last few weeks, there have been several NBA players that have been posting photos supporting Louis Farrakhan. And then there's the Nick Cannon situation, which we can get into a little bit later. But Louis Farrakhan keeps popping up over and over as a source for, um, you know, African Americans in the entertainment and sports fields that they take a significant amount of um, inspiration from him because he preaches all sorts of things that empower them as well. But then also attached to that is an incredible amount of anti-Semitism. And clearly there has, you know, there is not a filter that is filtering out the negatives of the aspects of what he preaches. So let me just add a little in terms of my own preparation for us being together to give context to Louis Farrakhan. He, his most famous achievement publicly was leading in 1995, the Million Man March. Um, he did so with three goals, and that was to address black empowerment, voter registration, and less gun violence. And it, was, it wasn't a million, but it was hundreds of thousands of black men and their sons who participated, many registered to vote. Interestingly, as we pause in this moment to honor the life of John Lewis, the great civil rights leader, John Lewis publicly stated he would not participate in the Mil Million Man March because of Louis Farrakhan's bigotry and anti-Semitism. And the Southern Poverty Law Center identified with the civil rights movement, has since labeled the Nation of Islam a hate group and particularly virulent or vicious are the statements of Louis Farrakhan. When he was asked if he's an anti-Semite, he said something like, I'm just anti-termite. And he just consistently spoken with the language that you know, pushes all those Jewish buttons of fear about Jews controlling the, as a conspiracy, the money, the slave trade. He said that it was Jews who controlled the slave trade, which has been proven and debunked, and has seen and presented Jews as colonial power. So at the same time, he is very popular in a community, which is an um, resonating with a consistent message. It's 40 years now of him preaching black empowerment. So that's the, the positive side of his message. But back to our topic of anti-Semitism, it does come with his consistent and virulent anti-Semitic comments that in the story of the Jacksons um, was retweeted. What's the size of their Twitter, Instagram followership? Um, I would say in the hundreds, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, probably. Yeah, yeah. It's huge. I mean, and that's, again, what makes this a different kind of a moment. And what has been, I know both of them have apologized. Talk a little bit about Deshaun Jackson and Stephen Jackson, and then I'll say a word about Nick Cannon and their apologies. So Deshaun Jackson, I think his apology was solid. It was the team. The team put out a statement condemning him, and then he put out a, a, he put out several statements. The first being trying to explain why he he was being misunderstood, and that he didn't intend any hate. And then a second, better apology, explaining um, that he recognized why what he was saying was hurtful and anti-Semitic, and apologizing for that. And that was a very important key. A very important key in an apology is saying, I recognize why this is hurting you and I don't want to hurt you and I apologize for hurting you and I want to grow and learn from that. Those are kind of the biggest keys. And I talked to a lot of PR executives in the past couple of weeks about how to craft a crisis apology. And that was the biggest thing that they said. Those were, they, most of them have a checklist that makes sure that they check off those different things. And so Steven Jackson 
he part of the issue with Steven Jackson is that he loves to talk and he hates to apologize and he's incredibly stubborn. And this is the phenomenon known as keeping it real. And so Steven Jackson is very proud of keeping it real and keeping it real really it, it mostly comes down to a combination of being willing to say whatever it is that you want to say, regardless of how it could impact people that are hearing it and being confident to the point of stubbornness and not being willing to listen to counter arguments or how other people feel. And so Steven Jackson initially, when he was being challenged to apologize, doubled down and said, I'm not apologizing. I'm supporting him speaking his truth and I'm speaking my truth and you can't tell me what to think. And he ended up putting multiple videos on Instagram and then eventually doing Instagram live videos where he was bringing on random fans of his to engage in a conversation just like you and I are. And he ended up bringing on uh, what looked like a guy in his 20s who had some funny you know, pun on Yarmulke or something like that or Keepa or something like that um, as his Instagram name, which was I thought was pretty ironic. And so they had a really fascinating conversation where – Steven Jackson starts bringing up the Rothschild saying that the Jews control all the banks in the world and that the Jews are, you know, kind of at the levers of control in society and creating systemic oppression. And this, this guy is trying to explain to him that while there are certainly plenty of Jewish people that are in power, there is not a, that it's unfair to accuse the entire Jewish people of being engaged in a conspiracy and that that is the part that is anti-Semitic is that you're dehumanizing the individuality of an entire massive group of people because of the actions of a, of a select few. And Stephen Jackson's, most of his responses to that were, um, listen, I don't care about Jewish history and Jews don't care about black history. We don't care about each other's struggles and let's leave it at that. And of course, that's ridiculous. And <laughs> the response to that was, how could you say that? Of course, we care about you and your history. You're a fellow human being and you should care about us and our history as well. And so it was clear that you could see the wheels turning that Stephen Jackson was someone who will fight for him, his people and what he believes in and doesn't really care about everybody else. And it's not a matter of hate as much as it's just a matter that he just cares about his problems and doesn't really have the latitude to care about others. And over the course of these conversations, you started to see the wheels turning his head where he's realizing maybe that's not fair because I'm out here asking everyone else to care about my struggle and how could I get anyone else to care about it if I'm not going to care about anyone else's. And so uh, I'll, I'll see the floor to you. You could probably talk a bit about the conversation you had with your friend, uh, Rabbi David Wolpe. So I'm going to invite people um, to put questions into the questions and answer. I have two or three more questions for Jared, and then I'm gonna to turn to your questions. So if you do have a question, at the bottom of the screen is Q&A. Please submit, and then I will share. So one last piece, because again, it's what I most um, was concerned about in reading your article. You gave an example of somebody in professional sports saying something anti-gay. Give that example. And what was the repercussion? How long ago was that? Whew, that must have been about 10 years ago, I want to say. And it was a former all-star player who was retired named Tim Hardaway Sr., whose son Tim Hardaway Jr. plays in the NBA now. And he went on a radio show and literally said, I hate gay people and was proudly homophobic. And that and that was an instance where the commissioner did address it and the reason why was because he said this several days before he was going to appear at an all-star event for the nba on be on the, representing the nba very specifically so the timing could have been possibly worse and so they canceled obviously they canceled the appearances and the commissioner who was david stern at the time who has since passed but was also jewish um, he put out a statement saying that the NBA condones, uh, condemns this and does not condone any sort of hate speech. So as a young Jewish American man, aware that all kinds of hate speech is condemned by the people who have power to do so and by peers in professional sports, and distinctly that is not the case 
how to talk about how that makes you feel. What are your concerns? I'm upset. I'm upset. This is, I'm a part of the NBA community. Um, I'm not a valued stakeholder, like a player or a, you know, a team personnel or executive would be, but I'm a part of it. And I'm a part of telling the story of the NBA. And there are lots of people in the NBA that value, that value me, even if there are lots of players that would wish I could go away. And when I see a lot of players who I've actually written many great things about and appraise them for everything that they've done in their careers and in their lives and have held them up as heroes in so many respects and have helped a lot of them, frankly, make a lot of their money because I've given them terrific coverage and I've shown the world how good they are at playing basketball. It's very frustrating when I see their peers espousing, you know, not only are they just saying, I don't like Jewish people, but they're espousing absurd nonsense against Jewish people and nobody is stepping up to say anything. And it's, it is really concerning. And so, you know, I said before why I felt that I understood from a corporate risk management strategy, why Adam Silver did not issue a statement in this particular situation. But I was a little disappointed that frankly, you know, while us, myself and a lot of the players uh, or other out authors of the story after we release a story. We did hear from people around the league thanking us. Um, I heard from a lot of front office executives around the league thanking us, a bunch of agents and stuff like that. Nobody from the league office ever reached out and said anything about this. So that, that was really disappointing. Um, and I know, that, I mean, I know plenty of Jewish people in the league office that I'm sure were very happy to see this being written, but it was disappointing that even quietly off the record, where I have these off the record conversations, nobody reached out. And I really, I really wish they would have at least let me know, I support what you're doing. And I do agree that this is an issue because it's been very clear that this is an issue as we've seen more NBA players espousing, whether it's anti-Semitism or there are players now saying that they're anti-vaxxers and that they think COVID is a conspiracy to you know, control us. Like we need to confront ignorance when ignorance is being spread and not just laugh it off as we've learned in 2016. So my son Joey reminds me that the, there is this rise of public expressions of anti-Semitism but it's also the best of times for Jews in America in terms of acceptance in the larger community, influence, and affluence. So here's some statistics. 10 of 32 NFL teams have Jewish owners, 14 of 30 NBA teams, and 7 of the 30 Major League Baseball teams. The, that particular information came to me from a friend congregant who said, do you think that some of the anti-Semitism espoused by professional athletes is because of Jewish ownership in a big way? And what would you say about Jewish owners? And this person also added that the language that's been used till now of owners and players and traders kind of resonates with slavery language and therefore puts the Jewish owners in this addedly, mm, not vulnerable, but negative position. Say a little bit about Jews in power. So let's start with the terminology. And I'm glad that you asked that because there's been a trend starting in the last few years where NBA players have been coming out. I think it started with uh, Draymond Green, who's a very outspoken player for the Golden State Warriors. He said that he doesn't like the term owner because it creates a plantation mentality. And the NBA had to deal with this in the wake of Donald Sterling, who I believe was Jewish, if I'm not mistaken, um, who was a horrible bigot and chauvinist who the league ran, literally forced him to sell in this incredibly unprecedented situation. I want want to say in 2014 or so, because he was caught on tape espousing uh, um, racism against Magic Johnson. And so who, of course, is a beloved figure in the community. And so um, the, the push over the years has been to get rid of the term owner and replace it with governor. And so the, the board of the principal owners or governors of the NBA has long been referred to as the board of governors. That's been in place for, I think, a decade or two now. And the owners have all agreed now to transition to the term governor. So we're now starting to change that. And I think that's a very positive change. Um, I think even my outlet, The Athletic, we're 
planning on changing the terminology, but we follow AP style books. So I think we have to wait for the AP to make the official change or whatever. But um, there, there definitely has been a cognizance of how even subtle things, microaggressions, terminology, things of that nature, how that can all create this, um, you know, this dynamic that you're referring to. And that's definitely important because, you know, there are a lot of Jewish owners in the NBA. I think a lot of them come from the venture capital world. And the venture capital world is obviously a very uh, controversial world. It's, you know, so I, I won't dive too deep into that. But uh, it does create, there's been a lot of players that have, I've, have suggested to me privately concerns that they're like my Jewish owners are venture or vulture capitalists. And it does feed in again to the idea of anti-Semitism and especially in the finance world. And so it is an issue. So I'm going to now shift to some of the questions that are on our questions and answer. And I'm going to ask that you try to give kind of a paragraph or two answer so that we can cover a few of them. Ifai Bell asks, what would be your response to anti-Semitism in the black community? It's a tough, uh, I'm not sure how to answer that question, but I would say that obviously any any form of prejudice especially within a group that has been a victim of prejudice is hypocritical and it should be called out and there's been i guess the best way to answer that has been there's been a concern that among black people that calling out anti-semitism is damaging to the black lives matter movement because i think because you don't want to acknowledge that there are flaws or flawed people within the greater movement and to that and what we wrote about in the story is to i would counter that by saying that by calling out people espousing hate within a movement that's calling for equality and peace and justice that it only strengthens the movement and so i hope that we see more of that now kareem abdul jabbar and we're i'm on the um west coast so we're i smile as our former laker he wrote an editorial calling out the Jacksons over anti-Semitism. And then there was a lot of negative pushback against him. Can you say a little bit about the price he paid for standing up against anti-Semitism? Yeah, he wrote an incredible piece. Um, and I think it was like in Hollywood Insider. And he's, it's amazing. Is He's one of the greatest basketball players ever, yet somehow is even a better writer. And most famously, Ice Cube, the former rapper and actor, uh, called him out and was espousing a lot of anti-Semitism and support of Louis Farrakhan. And there were a lot of people in the in the African American community, especially in the entertainment area, that were calling out Kareem. But Kareem is also an icon in, among basketball players, particularly basketball players that are um, focused on activism, like Jalen Brown or Ennis Cantor, because Kareem has been one of the great activist athletes of modern history. So there was a bit of rebuking from the entertainment world, but I think a lot of support from the basketball world. Now, at the same time, in terms of a lack of response, and this relates to Gail Geffen's question of why owners and players aren't speaking out, what are they afraid of? The, um, I was made aware that Charles Barkley, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, they stood up against anti-Semitism, but they're retired. Do you see it being an issue of an older player, a retired player, that the active players and active owners haven't really entered into speaking out? What would you say in regard to that distinction? You know, it's funny you bring up Charles Barkley because Charles Barkley very simply said that everyone that's a part of this movement shouldn't be contradicting themselves and be hypocritical, hypocritical and espousing hate. And Stephen Jackson replied by one, threatening to beat him up and two, calling Charles Barkley uh, something like sitting, like sitting in his ivory tower while Stephen Jackson is on the ground floor doing the work. And I think that plays into this is that Stephen Jackson, his credit has been, he basically put his life on hold to go protest in Minnesota in Flint, Michigan, where they still don't have clean drinking water somehow. He's turned into a full-time activist. And so I think that there's this fear among players who both like Stephen Jackson and don't want to get called out by Stephen Jackson as well, 
that they see Steven Jackson as act, being a really true activist on behalf of Black Lives Matter on a daily basis, and they're worried about getting called out if they try to go against him, and maybe they're worried about repercussions internally if they try to go against him. Um, but I, I just, I'm, I have no explanation for why Ennis Cantor was the only person that spoke up out of his own volition. I, I, I'm shocked by it. Your uncle Michael raises the question that Sterling was forced out of the league because he was a bigot. Isn't that a double standard in terms of people who are said bigoted things against Jews not being called out? Yeah, there is definitely a double standard to that, but the, um, Donald Sterling was the bigot emeritus. He, he had a lifetime achievement award in bigotry. It had been going on for years. He had been sued for racial discrimination by people within this organization. And they were just desperately looking for any way they could get rid of him because there were no real legal ways for them to get rid of him. And they just, they pounced on that scandal because it was such an ugly public scandal to force him out. Um. Jeffrey Poonam asks, have the NBA NFL players done a better job in denouncing anti-Semitism than the NBA players? Um, yes and no. Uh, there hasn't been a lot of denouncement, and there's actually been a few other NFL players that have espoused more of it. Ironically, a, an Eagles teammate of Deshaun Jackson named Malik Jackson defended him and espoused more support for Farrakhan and anti-Semitism. But there is one player who we highlighted in the story on The Athletic named Zach Brenner, who plays for the Pittsburgh Steelers, and he was incredibly affected by the terror attack at the temple in Pittsburgh, which was, I believe, was it last year? It's hard to even keep track these days. And so he has become incredibly vocal, uh, calling out Deshaun Jackson. And it was really beautiful to see that he ended up getting this massive following on social media because he was standing up for Jewish people. And it ended up with him becoming um, I, he got like all these invites to Shabbat dinners in the Pittsburgh area, things like that. Um, there were large groups donating lots of money to his charitable organizations and him reciprocating and things like that. And it created this very positive dialogue and positive environment. So he deserves a lot of credit. But again, very small, single, isolated situations in the NFL where there's, I want to say, 700 or so players in the NFL. So I'm going to do a shout out to Edie Burke and, and she asks about taking a knee. I'm going to wrap that, her question into what you already raised in terms of the uh, response and lack of response and double standard. And now use our remaining five or 10 minutes to move toward the happier topic of the NBA today. Tell us a little bit about this draft prospect from Israel Denny Avdia, who I understand his father was not Jewish, a Serbian who came and played professionally in Israel, married a Jewish Israeli, and has a son who was offered to play for either the Olympic Serbian team or the Israeli team and chose Israel, plays for Maccabee Tel Aviv. Uh, you told me you've been following him for years, so tell us a little bit about him as a draft prospect. Yeah, and turning down the Serbian national team, that's a huge, that's a big deal because they're one of the best teams in the world. But he is, he's fascinating because he's almost seven feet tall, but he he kind of plays like a, like a point guard almost. He's a really nice ball handler. He's a really good passer. He can shoot from anywhere on the floor. Um, so he's part of this kind of generation of European big men who are 6'10 to 7 feet, but they play like guards. And so I'm very excited about him. I think he has a very big future in the NBA. Tell us a little bit about the NBA bubble in Orlando and what we should expect as, as fans watching the NBA this season. It's going to be interesting. They So they're all staying at the Disney World uh, ESPN Wide World of Sports Complex. They're taking over three of the hotels that are at Disney World in Orlando. And uh, I think tomorrow night is opening night when the first games are going to be played. So it's it's going to be pretty fascinating. But they've played the last week of preseason warm-up games, and there haven't really been any issues aside from a couple injuries. And 
they committed to doing a closed bubble environment where players are not supposed to leave. And if they do leave, they have to quarantine for a certain period of time. And uh, people can Google Lou Williams if they want to hear a very funny example of how quarantining is going to happen. But so um, they've had zero positive COVID cases in the last couple of weeks, while baseball is on the verge of a complete shutdown because they didn't do the bubble system. So the NBA is worth paying attention to because this has significant implications just for the future of the country for the next couple of years as we try to kind of really tackle COVID and return to normal society. How long will the season be? Uh, it's going to end, I think, the second week of October. So the season formally starts tomorrow night, and it's going to – the NBA Finals should be over by probably early October. And although it's never safe to do, um, one prediction um, – of any kind in watching the NBA this season? Oh, well, your son's not going to like this, but I think the Clippers are going to win the title instead of the Lakers, which will be pretty <laughs> remarkable. Well, let me pull this together. I'm smiling at that. And it's nice to bring Joey into uh, our presence as well as John as NBA fans and so many others. I want to thank all of the people who have been listening and sharing it's uh, well over 70 screens. I want to thank you, Jared, for the quality of your writing and taking on an important topic for yourself and for all of us in terms of anti-Semitism. It's that quality of stepping forward and doing it with your ability to articulate both a problem and how to proceed in creating fuller truths of how we see and hear each other that gives me hope in this moment, which is, again, a moment of Jewish successes and Jewish threats um, to ignorance. And your stepping forward to address that ignorance is a gift to all of us. So on this air of Tishabav, we're reminded that Jews have a history of being caricatured and suffering for anti-Semitism, but we're also reminded of the ability to speak out in this country and in this moment. So a closing word from you, Jared, to maybe thank your, so many people you know who've tuned in. Oh, I want to thank you first and foremost, because before I wrote this piece, I had a great conversation with you. And uh, it was, I, I remember just calling you and I had to pull out the notes app on my phone and start taking notes furiously because you were imparting so many brilliant words of wisdom and a few of them made it into the story, especially um, the phrase half truths, which I thought were, was really brilliant. But the one thing that you said that really struck with me and really opened up my entire perspective just on humanity itself and was uh, a section of the story that was very widely shared by a lot of my favorite writers that in the uh, in the MBA, which I really appreciated was that the idea that we live our lives in concentric circles and it's incumbent upon us to expand our circles and overlap our circles with each other so that we can link with each other and find harmony. And uh, it was one of the most brilliant things I'd ever heard anyone say to me. And I wanna make sure that all of your congregants know that I'm, I'm only a great writer because I'm inspired by brilliant wordsmiths like yourself. Well, I'm honored. I love you. It's great love to you see too. you growing up and doing important things in our world. To all, many blessings. Thank you, Jared.